how to fish a flutter spoon. In my opinion, there's no better way to catch big fish in the post-spawn months, your June, July, and August. There's no better big fish presentation when those fish get done spawning, move offshore. This presentation right here, a fluttering piece of metal that mimics a giant shad, a, a, a larger than normal bait fish. It gets a lot of big bites. And if you can land them, you can win a tournament by a lot. So in this video, I'm gonna show you what I target, what I look for, the actual technique of fishing a, a flutter spoon, and just kind of the equipment I use uh, to put 20 plus pound bags in my boat during competition or having fun. Let's get it. talk about the equipment and that's just as important uh, as being able to locate the fish out there offshore. So um, starting with the reel, um, 8.5 to 1 gear ratio reel, real fast. Because I'm making long casts, because I'm winding in a lot of line quickly, I want a real fast reel. Uh, so 8.5 to 1, this is really important here, the line. This is a 50 pound test braided line and I've got it in the flash green color. So this is Seaguar Smackdown in flash green, 50 pound test. Very, very important because since we're flutter spooning, a lot of times we're jigging up and watching the line go back down towards the bottom. A lot of times that line will jump. That indicates a bite. So having that real bright green line, you could see that line, you could see those bites, you could set the hook. And that's to a FG knot, um, to a 25 pound test, um, Seaguar Abrazex or Invisex or Tatsu, just a 25 pound fluorocarbon leader, seven or eight inch spoon. This is two and a quarter ounces. Um, you know, big two-aught, three-aught hook, and that's the, the meat and potatoes there. Out of all this equipment here, the most important thing is the rod. In my opinion, you gotta have a rod with a longer butt, uh, a longer than normal rod, let's call it a flipping stick or a swim bait rod. This is a seven foot eight Mega Bass Destroyer Mark 48. It's my swim bait rod. It could handle the braid to fluorocarbon, and it's really good when you're out there fishing a spoon. It's got a longer than normal butt, and you're able to move that rod, that butt section, really move that spoon and get it fluttering and set the hook home. And much like swim bait fishing, uh, you know, if you really wanna learn a certain technique, especially the big fish techniques where you don't get a lot of bites but you catch a lot of big ones, the best way to learn those techniques is to limit yourself literally to one rod. I only brought one rod out here today. That's the only rod I'm gonna work on this technique flutter spoon fishing. So what to look for? It immediately starts with my Lake Master mapping. So Humminbird Lake Master mapping, it shows me all the little humps, long points, old foundations, road beds, offshore structure. That's the premier uh, flutter spoon structure. And that's what I like to target in the summer months. So we're talking June, July, August. That's when the flutter spoon shines. But if you look out here, these are two other critical pieces of structure that the flutter spoon works really well in. If you look right here, that's a tire reef. So basically you've got 30 to 40 feet underneath those tires. It just provides shade in the hot summer months. So you could literally pitch that flutter spoon up against these tire reefs, a lot of big suspended fish underneath them. And then behind those tires, you've got docks. So docks are really, really good uh, pieces of cover in the summer months that a flutter spoon also works in. And you literally just pitch that flutter spoon in there just like you would a jig, like you're pitching a jig. So. Let's get out here, graph around, and I'll show you what I look for. The first thing we wanna do is, is, you know, whenever I'm offshore fishing, I always like to establish where fish spawn. And that's in the backs of coves, that's, you know, the flat areas of the lake. So of course that occurs in February, March, and April. Um, so like this, for example, that's just a big, nice spawning cove. Um, but here we are in the summertime, we're flutter spoon fishing, and where do those fish go after the spawn? They won't go far. So we know that they spawn in the back of this pocket here in this big flat. They literally just go 
when they're done spawning out to the middle of the lake, not far from where they spawn. So underwater humps, big, big players in the summertime. Underwater humps, if you have a road bed like this Lake Master Chip shows, excellent, excellent stuff. Long sloping points with drops and breaks at the end of them. Really, really good stuff. Those guys on the Tennessee River, any type of ledge that comes out off the bank is a perfect piece of structure for bait fish to hang around in and a great place for deep summertime largemouth to hang around in. So again, what I like to do is kind of graph around. I idle around. I'm looking for bait fish. I'm looking for balls of bait, but more importantly, I'm looking for structure. You don't have to see the bass on the graph to actually catch them. You just want some kind of drop off, some kind of structure, brush piles, rock piles, road beds, old foundations, get off the bank. Those fish are a little less pressured. Um, and when you feed them that flutter spoon, um, you know, you're catching fish that that guy winding that crankbait isn't catching. As far as the presentation goes, when you're fishing a big flutter spoon, I always like to position myself almost one cast up current or upwind, directly upwind from that spot. That way I could fire down range, straight down, uh, straight down the wind. That way there's no bow in my line. So I know the wind is right at my back. That waypoint I just dropped is right behind me. And I just make that cast straight back towards that waypoint, cast out there. And we're in about 25 feet of water here. So I'm gonna watch my spoon again with that green line. I'm kind of watching my spoon fall and flutter. This is braided to fluorocarbon with a seven foot eight rod. I can really feel that thing moving down there and fluttering. A lot of times you'll get bites on the fall, but really where you do most of your damage with the flutter spoon is when it hits the bottom. Here's the presentation, lift and drop. Every time I lift it, I'm lifting it three or four feet off the bottom and then it flutters back down and I can feel that spoon pulling back. That's when you're effective. So it's a semi-slack line. As it's falling, you can feel those bites. That's when it's natural to those fish. It looks like a big dying bait fish. And in the summer months, when they've seen a million crankbaits, they've seen a million hair jigs and, and, and you know football jigs, this is just a different presentation that triggers big fish to bite. So I kind of like to keep my right hand on the reel and with my left hand, I push down on the butt and a pendulum swings that rod back. It lifts that spoon and I just follow it right back down. I watch my line and I could see that thing and feel it fluttering back down and mo almost all the bites will occur while it's falling. And big ones just can't stand it. So lift, drop, lift, drop. And when one bites it, all I have to do is come back, set the hook and start reeling, get all those hook points moving to the boat. So it's a real simple presentation, cast it out upwind, let it hit the bottom, let it flutter, let it do its thing on a semi slack line. One final kind of tip for uh, flutter spoon selection. I don't like trailer hooks. People ask me, how do you land those things? How do you land all those bites? This is the system I go for. People swear by the trailer hook, but in my opinion, when you add more hardware to a spoon, that just hinders the action and you won't get the bites. I'd much rather get the bites and have an opportunity to land those fish than not get the bite at all. So the more hardware you have hanging from that spoon, the less bites you're gonna get, the more restricted it is. So I like it unrestricted, just a swivel at the top, split ring, split ring, and then the hook. Um, if you have a feathered hook, tinsel hook, that's, that's all the better. But one treble hook, that's all I like. With this rod, reel, and line system, you'll land hopefully nine out of 10 of the bites you get. And I know it's worked for me. It's taken me a lot of years to get to that point. So that's my final tip. There's your setup. Match the spoon size to the forge in the lake you're fishing. And uh, hopefully you catch a lot more fish on the flutter spoon. Gosh, stay on there. Yeah!